right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. And I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Keating, who is in lovely Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, about seven o'clock in the evening right now, correct? That it is. And thanks so much for having me as part of your show. Appreciate it, John. Yeah, and Mark is part of a company called Sales Guru, he and a couple of his partners, uh, and they really go out in South Africa and help to build more effective salespeople and sales managers. And what I wanted to talk to Mark about today was one of the things that he advocates, uh, and I'm in a total agreement with this, is that you know, we, we, we're great at finding excuses, right? We can find excuses for anything and we can always find some outside, you know, forces and we can even find some data to back up our excuses at times. So if we're in sales, we can say, oh, economy's gone into recession. Nobody has any budgets. Uh, I can't sell anything. Or economy's booming. Oh, there's increased competition or there's price wars and, that, you know, okay. So there's always an excuse. But it really comes back to we have to look at ourselves and how we can take responsibility and do all the right things to put ourselves in the best position. So, Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about that, about why you feel that people need to kind of get off the excuse train and get on the accountability one? Sure. And, and uh, great comment that. Um, John, it, it, it's an ongoing challenge that a lot of sales forces that we get involved in throughout South Africa – the top performers we see take 100% responsibility, accountability, and ownership for their results. When things are going well, fantastic. When they're having a challenge, they still take responsibility. And I've just seen an increase in the lessening of responsibility and ownership amongst mediocre to poor salespeople. And even a bigger challenge is the amount of of um, non-ownership that's allowed by sales management mm-hmm. within teams and allows that to fester and grow. And I'm, I'm a massive proponent that one of the foundations of anyone within a sales role and, and o- almost a, the setting of the tone is them being crystal clear in regards to what their role entails and what they are responsible to do and removing the excuses mentality. Yeah, and I like what you just touched on there about people being allowed to not take responsibility, right? So sales managers, because obviously, uh, you know, in any in any organization, in any role, you tend to take your lead from your manager, right? So what's important to your manager is important to you. So if you're if it's in sales and your sales manager is kind of backing up your excuses or allowing you to kind of hide behind excuses, that obviously just permeates throughout the whole sales organization, right? Uh, absolutely. And um, I, I, if I can give you a real world example yeah, at please. the moment, in working with a very large motor organization here in South Africa, and uh, one of their largest motor dealerships has had an ongoing challenge of getting their 12 sales executives to contact the service customers or customers bringing their car in mm-hmm. for services and orphan clients. And the whole mindset around prospecting, picking up the phone, making contact was very much in a negative uh, sentiment. And the manager had allowed that to fester to the degree that they were actually having to pick out leads from the service center and hand it to sales execs and beg them to make the calls every day. Now, I don't want to rant too long. I'll make this quite short. Um, One of the things that I did right at the start was have one-on-one sessions with each salesperson and starting with... The account, well, starting with why they're getting out of bed in the morning to actually arrive at this dealership. Is, you know, the, the sales that they're making, is that going to allow them to continue? And if so, for how long? Because it's minimal sales. And where we got was actually getting them to give the commitment of what they need to do every single day, setting what I call minimal acceptable standards in order to achieve the results that they need. And where I'm getting to, a, you know, the long end of a short story here is – making them accountable 100% to the degree that what is the only thing that will cause this prospecting effort to fail? How will they ensure it doesn't happen? And if the manager and myself sees that it does happen, how would they like us to hold them accountable and correct? And I've given you a very long-winded answer, but there's so many things that need to go into it as that foundation. And if it's not set up correctly, 
everything just falls apart. The manager reviews end of the month, the sales results, and the the bad cycle continues. Yeah, no, there's a. I was just taking some notes. There's a lot of things in what you said there, and I, I'd like to take it right back to the beginning of what you said. And I love that idea about the uh, the fundamental motivation. So, why do you get out of bed in the morning? What What are you looking for? What are you as a sales or what am I looking for when I get out of bed in the morning? You know, what's my motivation to turn up for work? Um, I love that. So when you have that conversation with salespeople, what, what, what kind of things do you uncover? I, I, I love that we've got into this quickly, John, <laughs> because, um, you know, what I've heard portrayed for years, and I, I don't think so much from sales training organizations, but from managers that haven't been exposed to potentially the right way to do this, Sometimes people believe it's about selling the Lamborghini dream and the six-bedroomed house. When you get real world into this with salespeople, and for many of them, it's the first time that someone's having this conversation with them. For some of them, it's paying off their credit card debt, mm -hmm. making ends meet, affording uh, their, their children's education on a monthly basis, putting food on the table. The base fundamentals is the most important thing. And I'm talking for people that are struggling in sales what do you need to ensure that you keep your job and do you need to keep your job? And that's a separate conversation to a mediocre salesperson is, are you fulfilling your potential and how long can we stay at this level? To a top performer, and that's a very different conversation. We're achieving really great success, but what's the next goal point? What's the next achievement that's going to inspire you? And all of these actually need detailed conversation to make people think so it's very varied answers that i get yeah so um let, let's dig down for a moment because i think this is fascinating so when you say you have that conversation with maybe somebody who's new struggling a little bit maybe who's not a top performer maybe hasn't been a high earner um but nobody's had that conversation before with them what are some of the changes that you see happen once you know you get them to focus on this I, I, I think the starting point is actually sometimes people get so busy, and what I mean by this, two schools, the top performers get busy doing what they need to do every day to be successful. The underperformers get so busy doing everything they shouldn't be doing in order to be successful. And when you have this conversation, it pulls right out of, of from their mindset. What is the most important thing that I've actually got to do in regards to my earnings? Um, to start fulfilling myself, my family, and anything else as to where I am right now in my life. If I carry on doing what I'm doing, what is the the consequence going to be right now, and can I live with that consequence? And and it's quite a tough conversation to have at first. Um, where I'm adding on to this a little bit is we, we almost call, and you'll know this through your sales career, we call this layering. Getting the first answer is pretty much irrelevant. It's really layering that down into several other answers to come up with something that's quite clear. Other thing I found, John, is at times the initial conversation is not long enough. Sometimes we need to go away and think about this over a day or two or over a weekend to continue this conversation. And do you do you find uh, one of the differences between the high performers and maybe the people who aren't doing so well is exactly what you're talking about is maybe, you know, high performers in general have a good idea of where they're going or where they want to go and what their goals are. Maybe even, you know, a lot of top performing salespeople will have set out, here's how much I need to earn this year and then I'd like to earn an extra because I want to buy a boat or whatever it is. Um, do you find with the less, uh, with the more struggling ones that they don't have this idea about what they need and where they're trying to go? I, I, I think that, you know, anyone starting off in sales, or in fact, anyone getting out of bed to go and do sales every day, no one's waking up and saying, well, I, I hope I failed today and I hope it really goes badly for me. Everyone wants that success. I, I think it's kind of a, a little bit of a left curve here is that a lot of people have been beaten down in sales. And a lot of that responsibility is themselves, but also the manager and the company, that they've lost that belief that this can actually happen. And they've lost that belief in regards to being able to fulfill and start to achieve things in their sales role. So I think a huge thing is also from a manager to sit down and work out, do I believe that I've got the right people? Mm -hmm. Show them that I believe in them, that I have the belief in them myself. And how do we start to structure a plan in order to get them to start to achieve something uh, right from the outset?
Yeah. So um, well, one of the things you mentioned, one of the ways of doing that is uh, you said minimum acceptable standards, right? So talk to me a little bit more about that. What What does that look like when you set those up for salespeople? So uh, <clears throat> let me use that motor dealership as an example. Um, one of the conversations I had with someone that was selling four vehicles a month, or four motor cars a month, 47 years old that I got into a conversation, married, two children, and wasn't even being paid commission. He had to sell five cars a month to start earning the commission. Mm -hmm. So where he sat with is he could only continue for another six weeks earning that before he's got to make a move again. And he'd made moves in the last two years. Once we had agreed why it was important, it was then as opposed to me telling him how many cars to sell, how many cars does he, how much does he need to earn on a monthly basis in order to grow now, 30, 60, 90 days, how many cars does he need to sell? And from there, the minimal acceptable standards. In order to sell those cars and what is available outside of walk-ins, leads that are given, what's in his control to prospect to a service base and an orphan base? How many calls a day? How many people does he want to um, get into from a test drive perspective? And we agree on those standards that he commits to 100% over the next two-week period whilst we review. So it's some very basic standards. And in a B2B environment, that's broken down without spending too much time on this, is the number of meetings that, I've get to, that, that I need to know on a daily basis. Your, your very basic sales ratios, if I can mm -hmm. close from, but a commitment from them giving and agreeing to what those are. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I like what you've outlined because of the ho whole idea of having a plan. And I think that sometimes is is overlooked even. And I think even, uh, let's come back to sales managers. I think sales managers even get, because they get distracted, because they, they're focused on, you know, the end of month numbers or end of quarter numbers, reporting upwards and all of that. I think they forget sometimes to coach and mentor on the plan, right? As opposed to just being focused on the end result. Jeez, you know, now you make me jump back onto that box again, yeah, John. <laughs> I, I that our, our sales management has, has become very poor in a lot of ways because people have forgotten exactly what the term sales management is or our newer, younger generation um, getting into sales management are not doing some of the most important things in order to give their team the best chance of success. And I think the foundation of anything with a sales manager is an effective one-on-one -on -one detailed uh, written discussion um, in regards to an agreement between the two parties. In other words, if you're working for me in sales, John, I want to understand what your goal is, not your target, and we'll agree your target's your job, but why are you wanting to achieve that over and above? Because my goal should be to help you achieve your goal, which becomes our goal, and we make that plan. And, and in that lies in closing here, is sales managers need to spend a hell of a lot more time with their salespeople watching, assisting, prospecting, coaching, and out on the road or face-to-face -to, -face to help them bring in business and less time sitting behind their desks, punching numbers, spreadsheets, and many other things that's pulling them away. But but let's let's be honest. Um, what I agree 100% with you, let's be honest. How many sales managers or people who go into sales managers roles get the training and guidance to be able to do this? Because what you're talking about is, you know, let's face it, most sales managers come from, a, you know, have been salespeople themselves. Doing what you're talking about as opposed to selling is very different. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, another great point is, I see companies spend so much of their budget on marketing activities, advertising activities, and many other things to start to gain an interest in bringing customers on board, retaining, growing customers. But almost very little to no budget um, um, allocation to training and assisting the people that have the biggest impact on actually turning these leads into customers and retaining and growing. That being your sales force and the biggest impact are effectively ongoing trained and skilled sales managers. Most sales managers have had little to no mm -hmm. ongoing real skilled training. I think it's a, it's a massive opportunity that's being lost especially around effective coaching. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And, and coming yeah, from that yeah. background, I know that a lot of it is, you know, when people get sales training, then there's some sales management tagged on at the end as opposed to, you know, having dedicated sales management. And it tends to, 
it, companies tend to spend money on sales training when something bad has happened. You know, generally, I've come across companies who are very good at, you know, even when they're ahead of their, in their market and they're doing really well, they say, you know, we have to invest to stay ahead. But generally speaking, it tends to be, tends to be reactive. Absolutely. And I, I think you, you've hit another nerve there, John, is that so often sales training is seen as a Band-Aid mm -hmm. to come in and try and cover up something. And one of the biggest challenges is people see training almost as a once-off, and then they rely on it from a company perspective that some of these sales managers with little or, or limited skills on coaching are now left to try and coach and implement the training that they don't have a really good understanding about. So that's a, another very in-depth discussion as to how do you get an effective return on investment in training. I'm a massive believer that if the manager is not involved right from the outset with the head of sales, with an implementation execution program aligned to coaching and upskilling the manager, don't train. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and before we finish up, um, can you just give me an example of a company you work with and, you know, what was happening when you came in and how you changed it? You don't have to name the company, just, an ex just a real world example so people can maybe take away a few insights on how they should start. Perfect. So I'll give a, a real world example that, that's happening at the moment. Um, we're working with one of the major banks here in South Africa that had an ongoing challenge in, in regards to a structure around the sales force that they've got with no clear minimal acceptable standards, mm -hmm. no accountability, responsibility and ownership, and, and no way to really measure, review and coach um, around those elements. So a very loose management structure, and they were managing on a weekly and monthly basis purely related to where are we against target. Right. What we did was really take through some of the process we've discussed around effective one-on-one -on -one discussions, commitment forms between the parties, a measurement agreement as to how we're going to review it, an accountability perspective. I think a massive thing to finish off on that is also an agreed consequence should the parties not be in alignment to what they've committed to. And that's a massive thing I see as a weakness in a lot of sales teams. No clear consequences. Align then to a recognition incentivized program to really reward the behavior. And we've done that over the last six months and seen, I think it's a 35% increase wow. in sales across the board. So real world return on investment. But if you miss these elements, the whole thing implodes. Yeah, well, I think any anybody listening out there would love to get a 35% increase on you know whatever they're doing today. Okay, well, Mark, we're bumping up against the end of our time, but I want to give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself, about your company and what you do and how they can find out more. Uh, thanks so much, John. So in a nutshell, Sales Guru uh, over the last 12 years is now established as the leading sales instructor-led training program company in Southern Africa. Um, outside of in-house programs, we run ongoing public course programs, both for sales and sales management. We run the three biggest sales events, live events in South Africa, uh, three times a year for a thousand delegates in our three major cities. Mm -hmm. And then I'm very blessed to speak at about 60 to 70 conferences around so Southern Africa a year. And really appreciate being uh, being on your show. It's been a, a privilege. Yeah, listen, I really appreciate it, Mark. I appreciate you staying up in the evening and taking time here for us, uh, taking time out of your evening. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. I'll see you all again for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.